This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture's fell to rushing. Well, it's welcome back. Just welcome in general. We're going to be talking about gardening. Uh, there's so many programs here on MPB, all sorts of things, cr- f- critters and food and medicine and fix it up and f- money. Ma- there's so many things here on Fridays and rebroadcasts on Saturdays. We just talk about gardening. And like I mentioned in my opening, I'm not going to try to sell you anything. I might try to talk it. I'm not going to try to talk you anything. I try to present sometimes an opposing view. Uh, whether you prune crepe myrtles or not, I don't care. Pre- crepe myrtle doesn't care. Only your neighbors care, and they need to just shut up because of your crepe myrtle. You know, it's like plucking eyebrows. There's n- never going to please anybody if you pluck eyebrows wrong. So there's two sides to a lot of things, and uh, I'm here to sort of not moderate, but present them both. Hey, I brought some stuff in this morning when I was walking in. It's awfully nice out there. And uh, when I walked down my drive, I passed this little scene that I, I put out there. So po- I have a pollinator garden. And, uh, uh, Java, didn't you say they were talking about pollinators on Creature Comforts uh, Wednesday? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, just yesterday we had— Yesterday, um, Thursday. We and rebroadcast tomorrow. So if you missed the show, six a.m. Creature Conference, um, we had some guys on from the Entomological Museum from in Mississippi State. Yeah, know it well. Yeah, and they were talking about um, yeah because you came up when they started speaking about bug camp. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. And, and plus, I, I study entomology at that department. But we were talking about uh, yeah pollinators, uh, the bees, the butterflies, and what I learned like the beetles and other different types of flies and things are all pollinators. Yeah, and if you don't have them, you got to do it yourself. I had to hand pollinate my squash. I'm feel like a big old bumblebee. I need to tape some <laughs> wings on my back or something. <laughs> But uh, I do have a little, uh, it's a wildlife garden, not just pollinator. I, I welcome, uh, matter of fact, I, we added a, uh, my, my contractor Ronnie and I added a, a new porch and a, an arbor to my little shack. I live in a little shack behind my big house that I rent to female medical students. Anyway, built a really, really nice little arbor type thing to, to give me a, a feeling with spaciousness, I guess. But while they were doing some sawing on a piece of wood, it upset the whole house. And at the top eve of my house, a bunch of red wasps came boiling out because it was shaking their place. They were mad. <laughs> yeah, they, well, they were just, I don't know if they were mad, but they were definitely coming to check it out, you know, what's happening. And uh, anyway, I started to spray them. I realized they're up in the, they're not bothered me, and they got the size they did eating stuff I would rather not have. So unless they build a, uh, a nest right above my screen door, I'm going to just leave them alone. Part of wildlife. I got possums and raccoons. I got all kinds of lizards. I got creepy, slithery things and um, just all sorts of birds and squirrels and slugs and geckos and all that stuff because I've got a garden with a lot of stuff in it and I found out if you live and let live things work out got to put out a brush fire every now and then fire ants building up on my tomatoes I'm going to make them move along but uh, anyway I have a little sign down by the front that says uh, 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 wildlife garden this is an official thing from the uh, National Wildlife Federation you can go on their line nwf.org and fill out a little thing they'll send you a sign uh, but I had all sorts of flowers that are blooming this time of year with no water. You know, it's down, down, down by the street. Don't have a hose that'll reset for them. But one is this really pretty uh, lavender with yellow center New England aster. It's a bush type thing. It spreads. It's not, not weedy, but it spreads steadily every year. Completely covered with the beautiful uh, lavender with yellow center flowers. A real showy. But when I was walking in this morning, I found another little wild one. Um, it's, a, it's called frost aster. A little low-growing thing. You mow it. It's like a little bush. You mow it. It thickens up. Makes a little ground cover. And if you look at the flowers close, they're the same lavender with the, the yellow centers. And uh, we don't notice them because we wear bifocals. We can't see them. And they come up. We don't ask them to, so we call them weeds. But then we plant New England asters, which the bees don't care whether it's a big flower or a little flower. Size doesn't matter when you're little. So anyway, there's all sorts of stuff out there. In a little bit, I'm going to talk about my culinary plant of the week. 
and a couple of native plants, and I think, and an heirloom plant. Got something to share with y'all. But we're here to talk about gardening with gardeners. And we're going to start out this morning down in Mobile and talk to Louise. Hi, Louise. Thank you for calling. Hello. Hello. Okay. What's up? I have, I have a lawn, you know, that it, it's like psoriasis on the skin, I think. There's a little... <laughs> place of weeds and it seems to grow and I want I think this may be a good time of the year to to make a prettier lawn what do you recommend yeah, well it's it's really not the best time of year for that because we're sort of at the end D- down in mobile the grass can stay green sometimes all winter you know what we call grass doesn't really go dormant. It gets damaged by frost. It's evergreen in the tropics, subtropics, where it comes from. So, But um, this time of year, the kind of things that, that are going to be sprouting in uh, September, October, early November are the, the things that cause problems in the spring. The, 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 the dandelions, the uh, stickers, the henbit, all those, which I call meadow plants, wildflower meadow plants. The things that you're seeing right now, though, started back in the spring, and they're at the end of their season. So if you try to spray or pull, or, yeah, you can pull them up, but if you try to do much, it's going to leave a bare spot until next spring when the grass starts growing again. Uh, meanwhile, it's going to open up place for all sorts of weed seeds to sprout. So if you could just sort of live with it until next spring or early summer and take care of them, the things that are growing now are best controlled in the mid to late spring when they're young and actively growing and your grass has a chance to fill in the blank areas before more stuff starts up from seed and now uh, rather than killing the weeds what can i do for the grass what about some turf builder or or it's really really too late or? really too late uh, auburn university uh mississippi state university of georgia texas a and florida all the the turf people who teach turf management, which I studied at Mississippi State, they all say it's not a good idea to put nitrogen or other fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer on your lawn past around the first and middle of September because it doesn't have time for the grass to use it, spread, and then settle down for winter. If you, if you fertilize this late, you're likely to make your grass extra tender and a frost that it could normally take might damage it. So in general, I'd say wait until first to middle of April at the earliest to fertilize, and don't fertilize past around the first of September. I know what people who sell stuff are going to tell you something different. But okay. from the lawn's point of view, uh, mid-April to about the first of September, that's the time to fertilize grass so we can use it and settle down before winter. So what I would do is raise your mower, get it ready for winter time, let it go a little on the tall side through the winter. You'll have fewer weeds over the, the winter time, and, and let's see what happens next year. Yeah, I raised my my blade. I, I, I listened to you a lot, so I've, I have never. No, no, number yeah, one, number one thing you do, if you if you just you know keep it mowed high and then uh, in next next spring after you've mowed it a time or two, give it a little bit of fertilizer. That's pretty much ninety okay. percent of your weed control right there. So I'm, I'm off the hook. I do nothing but mow it a little bit till. April, and mm-hmm. then I'll call you back and ask you what to do. Well, just just give give her, give her a good quality lawn fertilizer sometime after you mowed it a time or two, and that's that's ninety percent of a good quality lawn mowing high little fertilizer every now and then. In April, no <laughs> earlier than April. Okay, thank you so much. All right, appreciate it, Louise. Thank you. Okay, let's slide up the road to Jackson. Talk to Gussie. Good morning. Good morning, and um, I really do enjoy listening to your program. Well, thanks for being part of it. Okay, thank you. My question is about uh, growing tulips and bulb flowers. Mm -hmm. I have a little area in my front yard that's about 3 feet by 10 feet that I want to put some bulb flowers in, Mm -hmm. but I don't know how to start it. I heard somewhere where instead of digging up, the ground, you could just put some sort of plastic over it. Oh, no, 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 no. Is this already dug up? Or is it grass here or what? What's already there? It's grass. Yeah. If you want to turn it into a flower bed, you know, then you really ought to scoop the grass off, dig it up a little bit, plant some stuff, and then cover it with, with bark or something, you know, to, to cover the ground up over the wintertime. And you can stick not just bulbs, but little flowers like pansies and violas that grow over the wintertime. The bulbs will come up through them and bloom great, and it'll be something to look at until the bulbs start blooming. Um, but if you want to just leave it as grass to mow it in the summertime, just take your bulbs and then uh, dig little holes here and there. And stick the bulbs down about twice as deep as they are big around, and ju- and they'll come up through the grass. 
You know, you, oh. you, you see a lot of, of old home sites that got bulbs come up in the middle of nowhere. Well, see, they, they grow over the wintertime, and when they start to die down in the spring is when you start mowing your grass. So you can have winter bulbs and things like that in the same place as a summer lawn. Oh, okay, then. Well, thank you so much. Oh, no, I want to give you an extra tip, Gussie. If you'll get okay. uh, not a big tall pot, but some wide pots, you know, uh, and then put maybe two or three of them out there towards one end. doesn't have to be all the way. You could, you could space them out if you want to or put it one. But put you some small, some low, wide pots and plant your tulips and bulbs and a pansy or two in those and let them sort of sit up on top of the grass and they'll look better. If you put a group of maybe three, I'm talking about a foot and a half, two foot wide pots and they're, okay. and they're kind of pretty. And then just planting that, you don't have to do any digging. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, thank you. That is so wonderful. You're telling you this. Yeah. yeah. So well, one last thing, and this not just for you, everybody else. Tulips are the only bulbs that really ought to be put in the refrigerator for a few weeks before you plant them. This is a tulips need a cold spell before they'll bloom right. And if you if you get daffodils and uh, hyacinths and those kind of things, there's no problem. But I would I would go ahead and plant those things with some pansies or violas in the pot and then stick the tulips in the refrigerator and then make a note on the calendar sometime uh, towards the end of next month. Pull them out and just stick them in between the other stuff. Oh, okay. A whole, whole, whole lot easier than digging up a bunch of dirt, Gussie. Yeah, it sure is, and I appreciate that. <laughs> Pots. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Appreciate your call. Okay, now we're going to go to Osaka. Hey, John, good morning, sir. Hey, how you doing, I'm sir? Fine, fine. Drinking some coffee, trying to get my, my, my gumption up. What's going on? Um. Me and my wife have a dispute over the coleus plant. Okay. Okay. Now, they are like two foot high and almost three foot wide. All yeah. Right, they're in pots. They're doing wonderful, but now they're flowering. Yep. Yeah. Now, one of us, I'm not going to say which one, says to pick the uh, flowers as they're coming up. Mm-hmm. And the other says leave them. Yeah. Uh, so you want my opinion? Yes, would like your opinion. How many, how many plants have you got? Uh, there's just two of them. Two? Pluck one and don't pluck one. <laughs> the plant doesn't care. They have pretty flowers. They're in the same family as mint, and the flower bees and butterflies actually like the flowers. So if um, if they look good with the flowers, they're going to look good. Without the flowers, they'll look better with the flowers. So it's just a matter of style. Some people want to pluck eyebrows. Some people let them run together. But it doesn't matter to the plant. If you pluck the flowers off, they will bush out and have more leaves. But it's kind of late this time of year for that. So what I would do is I would leave the flowers, at least a few of them, for the butterflies and the bees, and and um, and you know. So and to me, that's they're part of it. But it doesn't matter to the plant if you cut them off or not. Uh, if you cut them off earlier, the plant will bush out instead of trying to make seeds. It'll grow more leaves, but too late yeah, for that I this think, year. Okay, okay, you just answered it, and yes, my wife is right then. Because I've been picking them off over the last month there, and it, these things have just pushed out. Like you said, they're almost three foot wide. Yeah, well, you know, pluck, pluck some and leave some. How about that? I mean, like, how, how long have y'all been married? Uh, Fifteen years. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Um, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, Uncle. We were talking about this other day, and I said, "Okay, well, okay. wait until Friday. I will call Felder." Okay. okay. Now, now, I've, 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 I've told you know that the plant doesn't care and answers like that. But the bottom line is, whatever she wants, because she's <laughs> she's she's cooking tonight, ain't she? Yes. Okay. I know. A happy wife is a happy house. Yep, and uh, and and a happier you too. So anyway, y'all have fun. Pluck some and and put them in a bouquet and give it to her. Don't just drop them on the ground. Put them put them in a vase and give them to her. <laughs> okay, man. Good luck. I appreciate your call, John. By the way, uh, you know, there's a shrub called Eliagnus. 
and it's blooming right now, really, really fragrant. They have little small fruit, little banana-shaped fruits in, in December. But Eliagnus are, it's really a big vine. We treat it as a shrub, but it's a, it's a slow-growing, tall vine loaded with incredibly fragrant flowers right now. If you're not sure about that, peek down in yours and you'll see them. And uh, they smell wonderful. If you leave them alone, they'll have great fruits. I'm Horticulture's Edible Fruits. I'm Horticulture's Felder Rushing. We're going to take a little bit of a break and come back. And uh, and at the, when we come back out of the break, I want to play just a little short piece of a tune that's going to make all you freaky people feel good. And it's partly because it's talking about Frankenstein, but it's also because of those of us who are real frustrated with the way things are going in the world. Anyway, we're going to come back here on Mississippi Public Broadcasting right after this. <laughs> If you're print impaired, MPB's radio reading service is here for you. Our dedicated team of volunteers bring the world of news and entertainment to you. For information and to see if you qualify, call us at 601-432-6301. Alrighty, folks, welcome back. Horticulture's Fell to Rushing. We're going to be talking about gardening, so if you want to give us a call, it's toll free 1 877 MPB Ring. Uh, let's go to Picayune. Hey, buddy, thank you for holding, man. What's going on? Oh, good morning. Thank you for the Janice uh, Weiss solo. You bet. You know, this is a lot of, you know, it's the way we were raised, right? Yes, good old Susan Saran. Yep. Yep. <laughs> hey, what's up, guy? I have a question concerning wild persimmon. Mm-hmm. I I much prefer them over the big old domesticated kind and all. Mm-hmm. How do you go about rooting them, or can you grow them from their seeds? And is does it require a male and a female? Okay, uh, there. I don't know that they're easy to root. You know, some trees root, some don't, and I'm not sure that the. I, I know you can graft them, but I don't know that they root easily. I I'll have to to do head scratch on that in my plant propagating manual. Um, but I do know that if you grow them from seed, they're going to take seven or eight years to go through a juvenile phase before they reach fruiting, flowering maturity. Plants go through, trees go through that. It might be six, seven, eight years before you see any persimmons. And if you grow them from seed, you can't tell whether you have male or female. And I think I read someplace that in the wild, there's about 17 or 18 males for every female that come up from seed. I don't know if that's true. But anyway, your best bet is to go to a garden center and buy one that's been grafted. It says whether it's male or female. I, you know, it's just going to be a luck of the draw, though. Have to have separate I, male and female. I've never seen one in a garden center, not the wild variety. They're well, always, you know, like. Oh, the, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I say gar- most garden centers, you know, just carry the, you know, the uh, apple trees and pears and stuff. You know, you can find them online. Yeah. And it might be that you can find go online and find somebody that sells one that's had the male and female both grafted onto the same rootstock. I, I just don't know. But ha- have to have separate male and female or else find uh, – I'm not going to tell you where mine is, but I walk by one every <laughs> Friday morning. And it's loaded with, with uh, persimmons right now. But, you know, they have to be fully ripe before they lose their astringency. They usually oh, say – yeah, you only – I only eat the ones that hit the ground when I shake the tree. Yeah. Some people say you have to wait till after frost. That's coincidental. They just have to get past their little, they have to get through their overripe stage. But That's right. Get soft. 
Yeah. But if you do like persimmon, you know, the, the, the oriental, the Japanese one called fuyu, it's a pretty plant. And you don't have to wait till they're astringent to eat them. So, and they, they do taste like persimmon. It's not quite as tart as the wild ones. Yeah, the wild one is my favorite. I, mm. I've got one of the other trees, and they're okay. But just need, need this to find time of year, I'm I'm got my hidden tree out in the wooded area. There that you I go. That should be the all beat me the most. Of them. Yeah, be a gardener at home. Be a forager for the rest of it. <laughs> all right, sir. I thank you very much. Okay, appreciate it, man. Thanks for calling. Okay, now we're gonna slide up to Memphis. Gosh, we gone from the coast up to uh, to Tennessee. Hey, Susan, how are you this morning? I'm doing well, Felder. Good. Um, I, I have two questions for you. The first one is about pawpaw trees. Yeah. Uh, I've, been, I've been looking online, and, well, I have several pawpaw trees, and they're at the right age to start blooming and everything, but I, I looked online, and I can't find out when they bloom. I just found out they have to have a pollinator to bloom, but what month of the year do they bloom if they need a pollinator? It just says winter. Yeah, well, they they, they they bloom right before they leaf out in the springtime, and uh, and you might not see them. They're, they're about the size, you know. If you put your your thumb and your forefinger uh, together to make a circle, the flowers are about that big, and they're maroon. They're burgundy. You can't see them unless you're looking right at, and they f- f- point upwards. So you may not notice them. Now, they're 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 pretty, but they're small and they're burgundy. They're not really pretty. They're not really fragrant because the what they use for pollinators are beetles. It's weird. Beetles and maybe, beetles maybe some flies. There? Oh, they fly around. Beetle, beetles fly around all oh, the time. Okay. It might be some flies also, but uh, they're, they're not as attractive to butterflies, and they bloom before the butterf- butterflies are in, in, and they develop before honeybees were developed. So, you know, they're not used to that. So anyway, they bloom in the late winter right before they leaf out. Pretty little little uh, burgundy rosette. And um, if you've got several out there, I, you don't need to worry about the fact that if you have two or more di- different ones nearby, they, they tend to fr- produce fruit better than just one. Okay. Then I have another question. Uh, our deer population has kind of exploded. Mm-hmm. and. And I walk around my yard and I see, um, well, I see piles of deer poop. Mm-hmm. And my question is, uh, do they benefit the lawn? Or what do you, what do, you know, do you need to rake them up or no. do something? No, yeah, f- f- manure is manure. Uh, plants don't care if it's from, from a possum or a deer or a cow or a chicken, whatever. Manure is basically composted whatever they ate. So to run through a compost pile, you ran it through a digestive system. And, uh, if you, and they don't have a lot of nitrogen, but they do have a lot of micro. What I would do is I would just carry a stick and just whack them like it's a, uh, a golf ball and just spread it out. Okay, thank you. That's you, good. That's a, you know, that's a pretty weird question, but it's a good one. Well, we, we've got a lot of it around, and it's just, you know, the thing is they're piles. And and just so just spread it out and that that'll be okay. I don't have to move yeah. it. Yeah, go go to a garage sale or something and find a, a used uh, a golf club or something like that. And don't let the neighbors know what you're doing because they're really going to talk about you. <laughs> okay, I've actually I've got a metal <laughs> or, or, for removing dog poop, and I yeah. could just use that to break it up. Or better yet, if neighbors walk by and they're the kind that let their dogs poop in your yard, whack it yeah. towards them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, appreciate the call. Oh, by the way, I want to give a, a special thanks to a guy from Starbucks named Matt Little. Matt, um, oh, three or four weeks ago, he sent me a bunch of these bumper sticker type things about the, the Mississippi Magnolia, the In God We Trust Magnolia flag that says, Vote November the 3rd, yes. And I have given away, and uh, I mean, I've hand delivered them to people all over the metro area, and I've given away, and I put them at coffee shops, and I got them on my truck. But, Matt, I just want to let you know I really appreciate it, and every single one of them is gone. It's out there someplace. And uh, also, before we go into uh, to our, our cheesy tune thing, I want to share this letter from a neighbor named Johanna. Uh, Johanna and her husband have a naturalistic-style garden. You know, it's got wildflowers, it's got trees, it's got vines, and they mow a little path, and they've got little signs here and there to let neighbors know they're doing it on purpose. But here's, here's a letter. I, I got home the other day, and there's a pot of bulbs on my, on my, my front steps. And the note says, he said, these are from the garden of Gertrude May Saden McGregor, 1893-1987. She lived uh, in Ocean Springs. 
Uh, there are only three. These are, uh, she said, I understand that you actually already have some. And, folks, this is the yellow-blooming red spider lily. You know, the red spider lily comes in uh, pale, creamy, white, and yellow, and even an orange one. Uh, anyway, she said, we sold the, the lot a couple of years ago and took the bulbs with us. We, we were afraid the new owners might not notice them, and, uh, they would, and they'd be lost. So have a home in your garden would be an honor for Ms. McGregor. I hope you enjoy. And I would say thank you, but Mama said not to thank you for these or they won't grow. But the, my way of thanking pl- people for plants which I learned from my friend Gail Barton from Meridian, is to pass along the piece, piece to somebody else. Uh, I'm a hortico- Oh, oh, I got a joke. I got a joke. Java. Keep it clean. <laughs> oh, I will. There's, a, there's not many garden jokes that are also bad jokes that are also dad jokes. <laughs> now, have you ever heard of a, a tree called eucalyptus? Yes. Okay. Eucalyptus are the only plants that can tell you what's happening when you prune them. How do they do that? Eucalyptus. Wow. That was a good... Uh, Thank, yeah, yeah. A good, bad dad, but it was a garden joke, and it was clean. It was a trifecta joke. Yeah. <laughs> hey, let's play just a little bit of a cheesy tune to sort of jazz things up, shift gears a little bit. It is a live program. We appreciate all the folks who support us uh, through the drive time last week, a whole bunch of us. We really appreciate it. Um I try to bring in a, a wildflower, some kind of culinary plant, and an heirloom plant to talk about every week, sort of a of a audio show and tell, a hear and tell type thing. Um, and if you want to shoot me an email during the week, it's garden at mpbonline.org. You can also go to mpbonline.org and listen to past podcasts of the program. Today, I'm going to post a picture of my New England aster and the other fall wildflowers around my, my uh, backyard wildlife habitat sign. So be sure to check out the podcast, mpbonline.org. Me and Java appreciate all of y'all. We'll be right back. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. All righty, folks, welcome back. Horticulture's fell to rushing. We got some lines open. Uh, Liz Gill is in there taking the screen and the calls. We really appreciate she's our phone greeter today, um, and we appreciate Liz. She's also a, one of the uh, producers here at MPB, and her husband is the uh, director for um, uh, the University Press of Mississippi, who's publishing this book coming out uh, early next year about Dr. Dirt and other people who are determined independent gardeners. That's going to be a Mississippi 
published book. We really appreciate that. Uh, before we go to the calls, let me mention that I brought uh, the New England Aster to talk about, but and uh, and I talked a little bit about the past long bulbs. But the other wildflower of the year, this is it's it's all out there. Is a plant that makes a rosette, big rosette, maybe two, sometimes two and a half feet across, big leaves, up to a foot long and maybe six or eight inches wide they're gray green and they're really really furry and java i got you to feel this leaf this morning so. and it and it the only way i can explain it is the same way um another co-worker here it feels like a blanket yeah it feels it's like that, a little, it's that soft it's real real soft and big wide leaves it's called mullen giant mullen and uh it has stalks of yellow flowers in the spring and, and summertime but right now over the winter time it's nice little tight rosettes of big leaves uh and this common name is uh because it's big and it's flat and it's soft it's called camper's friend and i I'm like a, i'm gonna let it go at that i'm gonna <laughs> let it go at that but camper friends are giant mullen terrific plant that looks great all winter long and you can get it started in your garden pretty easily anyway let's start out uh, with the calls uh and talk to jeff hey jeff how are you sir hey fella how you doing fine you're from byram uh-huh yeah what's up yeah. Well, um, I went on uh, vacation or out of town for a week late September, and when I came back, um, I saw a couple of small yellow spots in my front yard Uh and um, didn't think too much of it. Uh, But since that time, they've kind of spread out a little bit more. And I'm wondering if if what it is and if there's something that I need to do about it. I, I saw online somewhere that it might be chinch bugs or even no, melting no. pot. Uh, do these have kind of a curve to it? There's circles, their rings got a curve to it, or is it real random? Uh, it's kind of random. Uh, they started out kind of circleish, but of course not perfect. Um, yeah. Now it's just kind of random. Yeah. Well, if, if you can see any kind, you know, sort of squint your eyes, if you can see kind of like curves or circles, that would be mm-hmm. brown patch, which shows up when we have uh, warm days and cool wet nights, like we had a couple of weeks ago. And okay. uh, it's a fungus that starts out in one spot and it spreads out like a ripple on a pond. Okay. okay. It spreads like that. And sometimes they can run together, but if you see any curve at all, it's going to be brown patch, which normally is not that big a deal, as long as okay. you don't over-fertilize your grass, because fertilizer just fires up diseases. A little fertilizer uh-huh. in the spring or summer, and raise your mower up. Uh, most of the time, the brown patch will disappear when the weather changes. But yeah. if it's real random, if it's just, you know, no curves at all, it's likely chinch bugs. If you've got St. Augustine grass. I do. I do. Chinch, chinch bugs are tiny. They're not much bigger than ants, and they move fast. It's hard to catch them. And I, I know about them, and I have a hard time catching them because they drop to the ground even if your shadow falls on them. Um, and as they suck sap out of the plant, they inject a poison that actually continues to, to poison the grass even after you kill the chinch bugs. So if you think you got chinch bugs, really about all you can do would be to use an insecticide a couple of times, you know, mix it with water, wet the air down really, really good with a little insecticide with a lot of water. It won't hurt your, you know, you know it won't hurt worms if you, unless you overdo it. And do that mm-hmm. twice, about a week or so apart to make you catch, catch any you might miss the first time. And mm-hmm. expect the yellow to keep spreading a little bit even after you kill them because they poisoned it. But a lot of times the grass will recover. Gotcha. And on that chinch bug thing, I saw that a lot of people were saying, Use like an old coffee can or something, stick it in the ground, fill it with water. Does that really work? <laughs> sort of, sort of. But what okay. I do is I cre- I get on my hands and knees. The neighbors think I've been drinking too much. I walk around on my hands <laughs> and knees in the yard. But if you'll creep up on an area around the edges of it without your shadow falling on it and just stare, what looks like, you know how ants move kind of fast and erratic? Mm-hmm. These do the same thing. They're little black, and they fold their wings on their back, so they look like they're black with white on them. But they're they're not much bigger than if you run your hand or you shout it, they drop to the ground. Gotcha. So what they're saying with the uh, the coffee can is uh, push it down, fill it with water, and they'll float up to the top. <laughs> you got to be really quick to do that. Okay. But okay. I w- I would say if it's real random looking areas, no curve at all, it's likely chinch bugs. Okay. Okay. Well, that tells me what I need to know. Okay. Good luck on it, man. All right. Thanks, Phil. All right. Now, we got Gussie's call back from Jackson. Gussie, what's up? What's up, lady? I'm calling because I'd like to know. I have two questions. The first question is, 
what um, would be some of the best fruit trees to start growing if you've never done that before? And the second question is about organic gardening and why when you go to the store, some things are just organic and some things are certified organic. What makes it? Well, you know, or, organic can can be all sorts of things. You know, it just means they haven't used uh, chemicals on it. But certified means that the farm is inspected and they've done it. They've got a history. They've done it for certain. In other words, they jump through some hoops to get that special certification. Organic probably is okay. But uh, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm I'm mostly organic. I, you know, if I buy fruit, I wash it off. But um, I'll, you know, you go to some of these uh, natural food stores and they're their peppers look so pretty and big and uniform. They've been sprayed, but they've been sprayed with oh. organic stuff like pyrethrins, which are still poisons. See, so the main thing is just relax about it. Wash stuff if you're not sure about it. Now, and, and that's just sort of the approach I use. And I have worked a lot. I've been publishing organic gardening magazines, so I kind of keep track of that. Um, as far as fruits, there's a lot of really good fruit producing plants that are also just good yard plants. Trees and shrubs for the yard. Blueberries, terrific shrubs. Good fall colors, nice flower, and they make blueberries. So you just treat it like you would a, a shrub. Uh, the Japanese are oriental persimmons. Beautiful plants. Really, really easy to grow. No real problems. Uh, super attractive this year. They're the size of your fist. They're nice and orange, and they are delicious right off the tree. People don't think about those kind of things. They think about apples and pears and peaches and plums and pecans. All of those require sprays. We have so many insects and diseases on on uh, peaches and plums, apples and pears that if you don't spray, you like here in the South, you're likely to not have um, uh, any fruit. Now, you know, if you're out in the country and there's nothing else around there, maybe. But in town, there's so many uh, insects and diseases that you almost, if it starts with a P, peaches, plums, pecans, they're gonna have to be sprayed. But I tell you what you could do, Gus. If you'll send me an email, I put together. I give a, a lecture every year at Hutto's, which is Garden Center, in Jackson. Every February, we have a, a a workshop, and there's usually a lot of people there about uh, homegrown fruit. I have it all in a little publication. It's free. I can send it right to you online. It lists a little bit about how to plant them, a little bit about how to prune them, and a, a lot of different kind of plants that you would not think of as fruit plants. But they're terrific. But but okay. to answer your question, you just treat them like regular trees or shrub. Dig a wide hole, loosen up the roots, stick them in there, and keep the lawnmower off the lawnmower off the trunk. And if you choose good plants, that's all you really need. Okay. So, what? Uh, how do I get your uh, email? If you'll send a, a, an email to garden at mpbonline dot org, it gets forwarded right to me. And it's a you know it's 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 it's, it's a neat little p- publication. It's like front and back of two pages if you wanted to print it out. But it's got some surprise. You know, I mentioned a shrub called Eliagnus a little while ago. It's just a yard bush, but right now it's in full bloom. And in December, it will have tons of little tiny sweet banana type uh, fruit uh, fruit things on them. Oh, okay. And and, and, right. and even if you don't have one, your neighbor's got one, and they don't know about it. And now you do. <laughs> Okay. Send me, well, an, you. send me an email, Gus. I'll send you this list. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Now let's slide up to Greenwood. Hey, Bill. How you doing, man? Bill. Bill. He, he, he slipped away. Okay. So let's, I guess, move to Pat down in Gulfport. Hey, Pat, thank you for holding. Hi there. I have two questions. Mm-hmm. I have an avocado tree that was grown from a seed. I have two of them. They're about 12 years old. I've pruned it so it doesn't get too high, but it's never produced. I had a question about that. And then the second question is, I have two mango trees. uh, They're about eight or nine years old, Mm -hmm. and they flower out every year, then turn brown and drop their flowers, and I don't know what to do. Uh, well, some of it could have to do with pollinators. You, know, you might not have any bees or, or other native pollinators working the flowers. You know, if a flower, if it blooms and it doesn't set fruit or if it has small fruit and then they don't develop, they fall off, usually that's either lack of pollination or a late cool spell or something like that, you know, that, that does that. Um, mangoes and, and um, avocados don't grow in Mississippi. They just don't. 
and I'm re- I'm real. Fr- I'm, I'm, they don't fruit them. Is I've spent so much time in the tropics, subtropics. Uh, this time la- uh, last January, I went to a a uh, uh, subtropical fruit farm down in South Florida. That's where the you know we just don't have we're not mango or avocado really? country. They don't even grow up in the panhandle of Florida. They need even a- if they're in a greenhouse. Oh, 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 are yours in a greenhouse? Okay. Well, actually, I have them in containers, and I bring them in. They don't ever get cold. Yeah. Well, you know, it's you know, it, it's possible if you bring them in and out, in in and out, that kind of thing. But uh, when I'm saying they don't grow here, in, out in the yard, they don't. Uh, same, right, you know. Right. So, but if you know, if if they're in a container, you need to make sure that you fertilize them with a an all purpose fertilizer that includes micronutrients. Now, I'm not trying to get technical, but, you know, the, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash, the, the three numbers on fertilizers, that's not enough right. for plants in containers. They also need zinc oh. and calcium and, and, and uh, manganese and uh, those kind of things. And if you'll get your fertilizer and look on the, the, uh, the ingredients, it'll list mm-hmm. things like iron and copper and uh, calcium, things like that, because mm-hmm. potting soils don't have those. Regular dirt does, but potting soil doesn't. So a little bit of a good, balanced Complete fertilizer without overdoing it, and good luck on the pollinators. Oh, thank I mean, you. I, you know, I'm not trying to be negative here, but I, I, I literally wrote a book called Growing Fruits and Berries in Mississippi. And if there was any way we could do those things, I'd sure give it a try. Wow. Anyway, have, thank fun, you. have fun with them and hang some Mardi Gras beads on them. Maybe that'll shame them into <laughs> fruiting. Okay. So, and if it does work, call me back. Let me know. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good luck on it. Oh, I know I sound negative, and as soon as I say something doesn't work, somebody say, well, I've been doing Mammal's been doing it. You, you just don't, you idiot. And, and I agree. There are exceptions to every rule, but in general, subtropic fruits don't do that well in the Magnolia State. Hey, let's, uh, let's go to um, Sarah Land, Alabama. Hey, Alan, how are you this morning? Very good. How about you? So far, so good. What's up? Okay. First question. Pendo palms. My wife wants to, be, wants to fertilize them, and she's going to wait and buy specially fertilized for them, which she knows about. Uh, is, is that something that should be done, or a simple 888 or 131313 to throw around it? Well, first of all, I do not recommend triple eight or triple thirteen for for, for landscapes. Okay. And the simple okay. reason is, if you use it more than twice, that's phosphorus and potash, the second, third number, they last for a long time. In sandy soils, they last for two or three years. So, if you use it more than twice, you've overdosed them on those. But the worst thing is the type of nitrogen that's in it is ammonium nitrate. It's fast, it's harsh, it's strong, and then it's gone. So it's like okay. uh, it's like garden cocaine. So for something like that, any kind of tree or shrub fertilizer that's got a slower type of – is going to have something besides just ammonium nitrate. It's going to be longer, slower, gentle, steady feeding, which is what the plants need. But it doesn't have to be palm fertilizer. Anything with the numbers are pretty close to the same. It's got something other than just ammonium nitrate will work just fine. But get this. If you'll, if you'll do your hand up like a fist and then open it up, that's enough fertilizer. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Don't overdo yeah. it. <laughs> and uh, and they don't have All roots right. to go way out, so just scatter any kind of good uh, uh, flowering shrub fertilizer. Just a scan handful or right around the base of each plant, and that's about it. All right. Second uh, question, my wife believes that I've built a yard up a little bit around the plant that may be holding water. That could be true. That's contributing could to, be uh, some of the branches uh, premature, the palms prematurely uh, dying, and she wants me to get a tractor, a little scoop of sandy topsoil to throw around it to build that area. Back well, up. see, if if you build it up, you just you know covering all those roots. You know they don't have roots; they got this furry looking, fuzzy looking thing instead of real roots like like regular trees and shrubs. If you fill in around it, you, it's like planting it too deep, and that can rot it. So, you know, that, that's the problem. They don't like to, you know, they do not want to stay wet. And if you pile stuff around it, you know, that'll, it's like burying the roots and they'll stay extra wet and all the kind of rains we get in the winter and the spring. So um, she's sort of right, but rather than pile stuff around it, I would just, have you got pretty good sandy soil? Yeah, I've got sandy, well, I've got 
access to it. Yes. No, but what I'm saying is your dirt is water stand. It's not clay, is it? No. Okay. Well, I, I wouldn't worry too much about it as long as it drains well. But I would not pile stuff up on the on the trunk of a palm tree or else it could rot. Some some palms can root up the stem, but most can't. So okay. you're gonna have to just you know throw some bark mulch or something like that. Whatever you know looks pretty. But I wouldn't fill in. Uh, I, I wouldn't build dirt up or, or sandy stuff up on the trunk. Okay. All right. I appreciate it. Good luck figuring that one out. Right. We covered a lot okay. of ground. Thank you. <laughs> you bet. Appreciate oh, it. No, that was great. Okay. All right. Now let's see if Bill's hanging in there from Greenwood. Bill, you with us? Uh, yeah, Felder. Uh, you were talking about a Ely Agnes. Yeah. Uh, when I was a kid, we had this banana. Well, we it was sort of like a banana bush. It didn't have bananas, but it was a bush. Yeah, banana yeah. shrub. Oh, is that what that is? No, no. Ely Agnes banana shrub separate things. Uh, well, I've been trying to find one, you know, around here, but I haven't seen, I know. Uh, Wait, which here, one? Which one? Uh, the, the banana bush when I was a kid. Yeah. Harrison used to put it out here, and but, you know, they're out of business. And so I don't I know. I don't know if you know, I started out horticulture working at Pearson's Nursery over in Indianola. No, I knew your mama very well, too. Yeah, well, I worked there when I was high school and college, and after I got out of the Navy, I worked at Pearson Nursery. Anyway, gar- Garden Center, the, it's not banana, you know, banana shrub. It goes by a weird name. A lot of times they call it Magnolia Fuscata, but it's got a new name, Michelle Yafigo. Anyway, it's banana bush. Garden centers can get it if they order it, where they normally get their plants, they can get a plant for you if they want to, because it's available in the trade. But whether they choose a cover to, to carry it or not just depends on whether they think people will buy it or not. But they can get it through their normal channels. Okay, good, good. I, I've been wanting to get one for so long. It smells okay. good. It smells good. It smells, and when they start smelling, it's just about the time you take your shoes off and start going barefoot and hope you don't have stickers. Yeah, well, I wonder how long how long do they smell? Just in the spring? Or yeah, certain- yeah, no, just just the spring, just the spring. Uh, and it's right about the end of winter. The first few warm days of spring is when you smell it. Um, but if you want something to smell good later, you've got to add something else, like sweet olive or something like that. Well, that takes me back to my childhood, back in the good old days. Yeah, it doesn't have to be childhood. And the good old days can still be here. It's all a matter of attitude, my friend. Yeah. But banana, but banana bush can can certainly perk your attitude up. Yeah. So anyway, good luck on it, man. Okay, bye bye. See ya. Okay, now let's slide out to flow of the just south of Jackson or just north of of uh, Florence, depending on which direction you're coming from. Hey, Lori, how are you this morning? Good. How are you? So far, so good. Uh, I had a question about straw last. Um, Tom, last year, um, November or December, I got straw from the grocery store mm-hmm. and spread it as mulch. Right. And I've noticed in the places that I spread it, which is almost everywhere uh, this year, I just didn't, it seemed like everything was a little stunted. Do you think that the straw could have had, I was reading about straw and hay having grays on and different things added to it sometimes it's sometimes it's it's, it, it is possible and and even some mulches uh actually have have things in that you know so it it that's a really that's a gray area there's a lot of concern but i don't know how you can tell you know what i'm saying i just unless you get stuff locally that you know has been grown so anyway there, there's no there's no real well to, way to tell when you buy stuff that's been uh, grown and sold in bulk like through mass merchandisers they're going to get it from the cheapest place they can a lot of times they've been treated with all sorts of stuff but in general it's not as big a problem as the as we we read about you know a lot of times they raise alarm about stuff that's not really that big a deal but it alarms people because it's it's interesting (laughs) so uh the main thing is uh you know if you're using the are you using this for mulch around your Flowers or something or what? Um, I had I had put it over the garden bed, like when it was cold. Yeah, you know, just uh, and then also put it around plants. Yeah, in the early spring. Yeah, but why not just use local pine straw? It's cheaper. Yeah, or or I have a oak tree. I could use the leaves. Uh, th- there's nothing better than regular real tree leaves because they break down. They decompose. They feed the back the beneficial bacteria and, and fungi and and uh, the earthworms. So that you know that's your best bet is if you can run them through the mower first, even mow better. <laughs> that 
That's right. Well, I also have a river birch that's uh, growing near the garden, and it got a little taller, and it got a little shadier, so mm-hmm. that might explain the stunted growth rather than the straw. But well, that and, and river birch roots everywhere. You know, they grow along the rivers, but it, if you don't have the river kind of dirt, their roots are going to be shallow and, and some, you know, stick your arm straight out, wiggle your fingers, and, and it could be that the, the roots are sucking your garden dry, too. Oh, so oh well. I know, I know, I know. Believe me, I know. <laughs> yeah, b- big old hug, because that's about all we can do. Maybe I should cut that tree. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know, or or put you some raised beds and grow up above it. Yeah, that's true. That's okay, true. but there's still the shade. Yeah, well, that's that. I I got a shady backyard. I grow my vegetables inside the house. I don't get enough sun, but it's the best I can do. So anyway, right. c- good luck on it, lady. Thank you. All righty. Ooh, folks, I want to thank you all for tuning in today, Mississippi Public Broadcast. We have this garden party every Friday live. And, oh, by the way, I got a package of stuff in the mail the other day. It has some persimmons in it and it has some dried goldenrod. I appreciate that, but I don't use medicinal herbs. I don't do it uh, for my allergies. I ain't going to take – I love goldenrod one of my favorite wildflowers, but I ain't going to make a tea out of it when I got the sniffles. I'm just not that way. And the persimmons, they were delicious. A little bit a little bit banged up before I got here, but I appreciate that. Anyway, uh, email during the week, garden at mpbonline.org. Yes, I'll be glad to send you my free list of good, dependable yard fruits for the, the deep and the lower and the Gulf, the, the Gulf South. Meanwhile, if you get a chance to uh, take a kid to a garden center or farmer's market, they may not be exposed to it unless you do it. And that's the kind of thing where, you know, every time you teach a kid about gardening, something that they can do, do themselves and in turn teach their children, in a way your spirit is living forever. So take a kid to a garden center, farmer's market, teach them how to do what we do best, folks, and that's get dirty. See you next week.